I'm Samantha Severo, and I'm here with Judge Neuenschwander. First, let's talk about your time here at Mount Union. You graduated in 1963? 1963, almost 48 years ago. <laughs> and uh, just to give you a, a quick uh, capsule, I came obviously in 1959, because back then we did tend to graduate in four years. I know things have changed a lot. And I came from Parma, Ohio, and came from a very, very large high school. And really uh, appreciated the opportunity to come to a small college to do some things that in my very, very large high school were not possible because you weren't a specialist or trained or what have you. So that was, uh, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. I did do a lot of things that I had never thought I would do. Um, I think a, a lot of it was not just the classroom, it was interacting with professors. And I think most, most importantly was getting involved in campus activities and leadership positions and sort of developing a whole person versus uh, being just a person in the classroom. So that was vital, and um, my sense is that's still happening at Mount Union today. Yeah. And having gone off to teach at a small liberal arts college like Mount Union, Carthage College, for many years, I know that is what I see students develop. They come in as a freshman, they look rather woe-begotten <laughs> and kind of sometimes lost, and then by the time they're a senior, they look like they're ready to go out and, and deal with the world. And I think a lot of that is, as I said, just doing different things that you wouldn't anticipate doing. So that was a great opportunity. And um, the greatest prof pro uh, professorial influence was uh, Professor John Saffel in the history department. Um, at that time, the history department was, I don't know how big it is today, but it was probably just uh, two and a half people. And so I made sure I took every single class that he offered, and he probably got tired of seeing me. But he taught me uh, just the incredible uh, critical skills that you need to go out in the world today and uh, yesterday and uh, also taught me an appreciation of history and the value of history and uh, we've been lifelong friends since then so I've been very very uh, blessed to have a man of his stature and uh, a mentor of that leadership but but it was a wonderful experience I was a member of ATO fraternity and found that uh, very valuable and uh, believe that was another part of my growth uh, I realize today there are many, many more activities on campus that students can engage in socially that uh, maybe fraternities and sororities aren't as important, but in um, the period I was here, there really wasn't a student union. Uh, there were the fraternity houses, the sorority houses, and then that was about it. Uh, if you lived in Miller Hall, there was Miller Hall, and there was Elliott, and I think they were building, uh, uh, I'm trying to think the hall they were building, but it was still pretty... Uh, you know, the gym was old and everything was kind of uh, back as you might expect it in the early 1960s. So do you return to campus a lot to see or is this? I come back about once a year. I do an annual visit to see John Saffel and then I usually manage to work in a Mountain Union football game. So I uh -huh. figure out a way to fly from Wisconsin and uh, go out to Copeland Oaks and spend uh, endless hours in conversation with uh, a 95, almost 96 year old uh, professor who doesn't seem to have lost a day in terms of his mental acuity, mm -hmm. and then come on campus and uh, watch a football game and maybe see a few fraternity brothers. And so, yeah, annually I come back. So I do see the buildings going up, and I do see where the gifts from alums are going, and I see the uh, continued uh, good health of the college, which is uh, quite uh, quite wonderful to see. So then you weren't shocked with all of these new changes? No, it's no, no. Somebody asked me that. I had an interview from the Dynamo this morning, uh, mm -hmm. and they asked. Uh, you know, have you been back since 1963? And I said, fortunately, otherwise I would be in culture shock because uh, obviously so much has changed and there's been so much building and uh, it, it would be quite a shock. But I've, I've seen the process and, of course, having been a college professor for 38 years, I saw it on my campus and so it's something I was living with at the time, so mm -hmm. it was easier to see and digest. So. Oh, that's good. Then it was comfortable for you. Right. So what about life after Mount Union? Can you trace your career a little bit for us? Uh, well, I'll try to make it not too long and too boring, but um, under the influence of uh, Professor Saffel, instead of going off to um, become a high school uh, teacher and a uh, basketball coach, which is what I originally came to Mount Union for, and that's a wonderful profession to go into, and we need, uh, my goodness, we need all the good <laughs> teachers we can have. He kind of influenced me to go to graduate school, so I went to the University of Vermont and received a master's degree and then came back to Case Western Reserve in Cleveland and uh, did my Ph.D. there and then went to Carthage in 1969 to begin teaching. And then about, oh, ten years into the process, uh, I began to think about the law school interest I had back as an undergraduate that I hadn't pursued, and so I 
decided to go to Chicago at night and do my night uh, law school program. And so four years lo later, I uh, emerged as a newly minted 42-year-old lawyer, which is a little old in the profession, and practiced for about a couple years and then eventually uh, managed to get elected to this judgeship that I've held since uh, actually 1985. So, uh, and I managed to balance, uh, it's, it's a half-time court. People sometimes don't understand how you can do that, but they just pack up everything in the morning and there are no afternoon sessions. So I was able to work out a dual career of being a uh, municipal judge in the morning and um, to be a, a college professor with a reduced load in the afternoon. So it's always confusing to people. How can you be uh, a judge, an attorney, a professor? Well, you do it in that fashion. So, and the college was very kind to me to allow me to go reduce load. So over the years, I taught uh, mostly history courses, but some law courses, um, criminal law, uh, some constitutional law, business law, so, and sports law. I taught a variety of law classes. So it's been a wonderful ride, and now I'm retired from teaching, but still, uh, still judging at least for the near for foreseeable future. I don't know if it'll go beyond next year, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Hmm. What is it exactly that excites you about both teaching and practicing law? Well, uh, I think I've been, I, I would just add a little caveat to that because I really haven't had to practice law. It's very nice to be up on the bench and have people appear in front of you rather than have to be on the other side and appear in front of judges uh, just from the standpoint of uh, the relationship. But uh, I think I like the stimulation, the critical thinking of the law, the idea that um, in some ways, as I'll say tonight, law is a reactive force. It reacts to situations that's brought to us, and I say law of the courts. Uh, I know we talk about laws, courts making law, but they really react to what cases come to them. And so there's all of that thinking process and writing process, and there's a the research, and I've always enjoyed research. So uh, I enjoy the job in part because I interact with people, but I also get a chance to use some research and writing skills. And it's always challenging. There's always a new case. There's always a new ruling. There's always a new approach. And, um, and I've also been involved in Wisconsin in teaching in uh, various judicial seminars with other judges. And that's been stimulating because I've had some good friends statewide that are I'm on committees with, and it's, it's just been a nice uh, attribute to tie together my teaching background with my law and judicial background. So it's been really a, just a wonderful uh, career situation, and I'm very, very thankful to uh, have had the privilege in both areas. Well, since you've had such a you know, feel in all these different areas, what are some important concepts that you've picked up you know, throughout your whole career? Well, I'd go back to uh, the days at Mount Union and the stress on uh, critical skills, stress on writing, the stress on being able to uh, be articulate when you're called upon to speak, and most importantly, the importance of uh, being able to have critical analysis. Um, I would have to say as a college professor over the years, and I probably, th probably the Carthage student body isn't too much different than the Mount Union student body, uh, I've had to decrease the volume of reading for students, and it's not that students are less capable, but I think with all the uh, the internet and all of the instant communication devices that exist, I think we are in a world of small sound bites and small read bites, mm -hmm. and so it's more difficult to take something fairly large and plunge into it and stay with it and to grasp it and to break it down. In other words, let's say you have a fairly uh, strong historical article that has a major thesis and a number of sub-theses and then it has the evidence that supports it. Can a student just go in and say, okay, let's start with uh, reading it through and then finding out how the author comes to his or her argument and how do they support the argument and are there any weaknesses? And that's very difficult. Yeah. And to me, it's still a vital skill in our society because uh, with all of the mass uh, communications out there, and how do you sort it all out? When uh, you're a student today, or myself, you Google something. Who put that website up? What's their background? What expertise do they have? Uh, it's like Wikipedia. Anybody can write for Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So is it really accurate, or do you have to have a bit of doubt or a caveat? And so I think it's a really a greater challenge today to have that critical intelligence so that you can sort things out, because it's just coming so fast and furious. Right. That, uh, in the past, as I said, when I was at Mount Union, uh, you had a typewriter and your books and your notes, and uh, that was it. Uh, now it's just overwhelming. So I think it's even more important today that uh, the students, as they grow through college, 
develop those skills so that not only for themselves but for our society. Right, there's all kinds of new methods. So. Methods and just an understanding. It's more difficult to understand an issue now because we get lost in the sound bites and lost in the videos mm -hmm. and we get instant opinion and it's immediate and then you say okay and then you got to step back mm -hmm. and uh, so I think it's absolutely crucial. Yes. Well kind of changing the topic a little bit, I understand that some yeah. of your works have been published? Uh, I was fortunate to uh, have a number of works published. I have two books, uh, a couple books I edited, uh, a few pamphlets, and then a bunch of articles I've authored over the year, both in the history field, but lately more in the law field. Yeah. Do you have any goals, future goals, of maybe publishing something else? Uh, my last book was more demanding than I thought it was going to be, mm -hmm. so I don't know. Um, it was published by Oxford Press, which is one of the uh, best presses in America, and I had a very good editor. And um, I almost felt like a graduate student because when I submitted my manuscript and it came back, I was shocked by what she wanted changed and what she suggested. And for a while, I was like, no, you can't be doing this. And I realized, well, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, we kind of hurried to meet a deadline, and we probably s jumped through some places we shouldn't have jumped through. And uh, so I was really appreciative of having that type of editorship that I think you know undergraduates and graduate students have with professors that really work on writing. They take the time to go over and try to help you grow to the next level of writing versus write, nice job, good, good effort, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because it really takes time. Of it course. takes a lot of work, and, uh, but it's the work that students need if they're going to grow in that area. Because if someone isn't critiquing you, and that's what I always used to tell my students, uh, when you go out in the world, and I'm out in the world, and I submit an article, and someone doesn't like it, they send it back to me and say, if you make these changes and do some rewrites here and here, we might publish it. So I have to deal with rewrites and the whole thing, so you have to also. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of taxonomic scale from yeah. uh, undergraduate all the way up to the professional level, and it never stops because we never... I think sometimes if you stop writing for a while, you may lose uh, some skills or they get a little rusty. So you need to almost keep writing, always write something so that that creative process is going forward. So um, that's what I would you know, suggest is really still even more vital today. Right. Well, thank you very much, Judge. That about wraps it up. So Appreciate again, it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, again, this has been Samantha Severo with Studio M.